talking about large impacts, can we talk about the importance of the moon and its creation and stuff? Yeah, the the moon's a puzzle that we still wonder about today, despite the fact it seems like it's a a sealed story. We think the moon formed from a huge impact. It's thought that there was a Mars-sized planet which smashed into the proto-Earth billions of years ago, for, no, just after the solar system formed. So the Earth would have been actually been larger than it had this impact not had occurred. It would have been maybe. 50% more massive than it is today, maybe twice as massive. And this impactor came along, smashed into the earth, it knocked off a huge amount of material. And it's thought that that impactor, which we normally give it the name Theia, would have been almost completely obliterated in this and vaporized in this, in this collision. And then some chunk of the earth was knocked off. And that chunk of the earth is ultimately what formed the moon or maybe even multiple moons that then coalesce later into a single moon. So there's, there's a huge amount of interest about why why you might come up with a speculative idea and, and still people are challenging this idea. The thing we know for sure is that the, the moon rocks that were collected by the Apollo, Apollo astronauts have almost the exact same isotropic ratio of oxygen, 18 to oxygen 17, I think it is, as Earth rocks do. And this is thought to be a fingerprint that the rocks formed in the exact same place around the sun. We look at rocks from Mars, we look at rocks from Venus, these are basically meteorites we've collected that land in on the Earth. They have distinct isotropic ratios, but the Moon and the Earth have exactly the same. So that tells us that they formed from the same inherent clump of material. That's challenging with this impactor. With the impactor, if this thing really did have its own unique origin, this impactor, Theia, why didn't it contaminate that then and have its own distinct signature that gets mixed in. So that has been a challenge. One idea that has been suggested to counteract this is called synestia. I think I'm pronouncing that right, synestia. And that's when the impact happened, it was so uh, extreme that it formed basically one giant donut shaped planet for a while. So the earth and the moon would have smashed together, formed basically a ball of lava, essentially, that was shaped like a, almost a donut in space, spinning very rapidly because of all the angular momentum from the impact, and then gradually have peeled off and formed a moon and the earth separately from this giant impact. The reason why this is attractive is because it allows for this material to mix in thoroughly. So, so this impact or whatever it was, Thea and the earth completely mix into one single object, and then it separates out into the earth and the moon separately. That seems to uh, explain some of the mysteries, but not everybody accepts that idea. And there's still a lot of controversy about the moon. Like the moon's far side has a very different appearance and thickness to the near side. Have you ever seen a picture of the far side of the moon? It looks radically different to the near side. The near side has these maria, these beautiful lava flows that happened millions of billions of years ago that kind of smooth it out. And then it has these more cratered uh, areas, whereas the far side is almost completely cratered. There's very, very few maria. That's because the crust, the actual lithosphere of the moon, is much thicker on the far side than the near side. And again, that's weird. Like, why Why should that be? Why is there a dichotomy like that? And so one, one idea of there is that actually two moons formed in this process, and then one kind of pancaked onto the back of the, no of the moons way. we know today. And that, it's that pancaking that then formed like a thicker shell on the far side of the moon. So there's, it's like, I wish we had a time machine because this would have been like the greatest fireworks show in, in, in the universe to have seen the formation of the moon. And again, it raises so many questions like how, how unique was that? Does that happen in other exoplanet systems? Are we special that this happened here? We don't really have any observational evidence either way, but obviously my team and I, one of the things we've been trying to do over the last few years is to try and detect moons around other planets to try and ultimately answer this question. Because at the end of the day, the moon has a huge influence on our planet. It stabilizes the obliquity of the Earth. It gives us the tides. It gives us, you know, the the rise and the fall of the tides, which potentially are a useful thing for life. They create rock pools on the on the on the coastlines, especially when the moon was closer in. It would have formed, you know, continent covering tides. Basically, the entire continent would have been covered in a massive tide that would have formed all these rock pools all over the place. Um, it also uh, potentially stripped off the upper mantle, the upper lithosphere of the Earth, and that What's could the have been useful. 
So basically the crust. So the crust may have been much thicker of the earth when it first formed. And then the impact could have ripped off some of that thick crust. And had that not had happened, the crust may have been too thick to have allowed for plate tectonics. So plate tectonics we think are absolutely crucial for life, as light life as we have it on the earth, because they allow for something called the carbon cycle. So when an animal dies in the bottom of the ocean, its carbon is locked up in its bones and its shell, whatever it is, and it settles down to the bottom of the ocean. It just stays there. And if there was no, if that was just the way it was, the, the world would run out of carbon, basically, and there'd be no way for animals to grow on the surface anymore because there'd be no carbon left. But instead what happens is these, these plates subduct and they go under each other, and so that carbon recycles, it comes back out in CO2 in volcanoes, and that allows access for photosynthesis to, to happen in plants, for instance. So without the carbon cycle, it's difficult to imagine how we'd have the biosphere we have today, and the moon may actually be the reason why we have a carbon cycle. For if it had not stripped off that upper uh, that upper crust, the crust would have been so thick that it would have formed what we call a stagnant lid. A stagnant lid is what we th is, seems to be the case with Venus. Venus seems to have a very thick uh, lithosphere, which basically prevents plate tectonics as we have them on the Earth. So yeah, very intriguing. Like you look at all the things the moon does and you think, wow, are we, are we a, a product of the moon? The idea of plate tectonics kind of tilling, like doing global tilling, uh, yeah. is so, so fascinating. And yeah, I, I mean, the moon being tidally locked or rotationally locked, what's that, what's that called? Yeah, tidally locked. Yeah, Tidally locked. Yeah, so we only ever see. How rare is that to have something that doesn't rotate at all? That seems... Bizarre. That's pretty. That's actually pretty common. So a lot, yeah, a lot of moons. That's true of because they're and, and we think we understand why this should happen. Whenever you get fairly close to a planet or a star, the the gravitational effect obviously increases as you get closer and closer, and it kind of locks in the the shape of that object to always have one side facing it. So especially if you have some kind of uh, fluids like the Earth does, these tides can be quite effective at, at slowing things down. Um, it happens for many moons around Jupiter, Saturn. So we think this is pretty common. It's thought that uh, this should be common for exoplanets as well, which is interesting, but again, unproven. But we think that there are some stars which have very close in planets, and those planets are so close that they should tidally lock to their star. And we've measured many of these hot Jupiters, and we've watched them whiz around their star, and we can even see basically re thermal maps. We can kind of re thermally map the distribution of energy on these planets, and they look indeed like they are tidally locked as we would expect them to be. So everything about exoplanets seems to support this idea that tidal locking should happen. But there are also mysteries of tidal locking. We don't really know exactly when it stops. The theories of tidal theory that we use are fairly primitive, to be honest. They kind of parameterize things in a very basic way. Ideally, you would just simulate an entire planet, like every single atom, but we just don't have computers powerful enough to, to simulate every single atom. So we use these simplified models, and we know these simplified models don't always work. So for instance, for Mercury, it was predicted that Mercury should be tidally locked to the sun, but it's not. It's in a pseudo-synchronous orbit, and probably the reason why that's happening is because is of general relativity, um, because actually there's general relativistic effects that come into play when you get close to a star as well. So it's thought that... Um, tidal locking should happen, but in some instances, it's more complicated than just a simple formula. And you really need to like think about the composition of the star, the composition of the planet, what it's made out of, does it have a core, what's its density profile like, how, how much general relativity kicking in here. So the calculation is quite non-trivial, but it does seem like it's common in the solar system and expected to be common elsewhere. Are there any other interesting rotations of planets in our solar system? Yeah, I mean, one of the things I think is interesting is Uranus uh, is tilted on its, its side, which is like kind of confusing. So even though its its spin isn't particularly unusual, it's somehow been knocked over. So it's just spinning in a sideways configuration. So that like it's rolling forward. It's it's like it's just it's it's axis in which it spins. Like the Earth's axis is basically pointed um, orthogonal to its to its orbital plane, mm -hmm. so normal to its orbital plane pointed up, if you like, whereas for Uranus, it's kind of tilted so that its North Pole is pointed at the sun. So, so it's, like North rolling Pole obviously... like it's like it's rolling forward on a surface that doesn't exist. Yeah, kind of, yeah. And and as it 
as it goes round, what's kind of weird is that the moons I've also tilted over alongside it. So this has been like curious how we can imagine maybe the planet getting knocked over on its side, but then why are all the moons also on its side as well? <laughs> we don't really understand what happened there. So very strange to understand what happened to Uranus. And then one of the one of the cool things we're thinking about a lot of my team at the moment in my research group, the Cool Words Lab, is the rotation of Jupiter and Saturn, which are rotating pretty fast, once every 10 hours. And we think this is uh, to be expected pretty much for all giant planets once you get far enough away from the star. So if the if Jupiter came too close to the sun, that tidal locking thing would click in and it would slow Jupiter down. It would put the brakes on Jupiter's spin and slow it down to days rotation rate, basically whatever its orbital period was. But Jupiter's far enough away that it still retains what we would call its primordial spin. And Jupiter and Saturn don't really have any way of getting rid of that spin. For the sun, it does lose spin. It was probably spinning much faster when it was young, and it's been losing it through its very strong magnetic fields. Jupiter has magnetic fields, but nowhere near strong enough that it can lose spin the same way that and the sun it's does. It's so far away from the sun that it's not going to be slowed down by being closer. Yes, correct. So it doesn't really have any way to shed this spin. That's interesting because we are now, we have some observations coming up with the James Webb Space Telescope in October, where we're going to basically measure a Jupiter analog. So a planet, an exoplanet around a different star, it's over a thousand light years away, but we're going to measure very precisely its shadow as it passes in front of another star. And we think that this planet should have similarly a fast spin. And why that's interesting is that that fast spin causes Jupiter to bulge out at its equator more than its pole. So it's actually 5% wider than it is tall. And Saturn's 10% wider than it is tall through this spinning effect. We think we can measure this. It's never been measured before. If we can measure it, it will tell us basically what the planet is made out of, how fast it's spinning, and even its tilt angle. So as I said, Uranus is tilted right over. Jupiter and Saturn are not very tilted compared to that, but we should be able to actually measure that angle for the first time and really get a deeper insight as to how these planets are forming. So I'm just excited that we might have access for the first time, thanks to James Webb, to a completely new observational technique learning about exoplanets. We have their mass, we have their radius, but now we can get their, their spin, their bulginess, their, their tilt angle, and really just complete the picture as to how these things formed. This episode is brought to you by element. Stop having coffee first thing in the morning. Your adenosine system that caffeine acts on isn't even active for the first 90 minutes of the day, but your adrenal system is and salt acts on your adrenal system. Element contains a science-backed electrolyte ratio of sodium, potassium, and magnesium with no sugar, no gluten, no coloring, no artificial ingredients, or any other BS. It plays a critical role in reducing muscle cramps and fatigue while optimizing brain health, regulating appetite, and curbing cravings. The orange flavor in a cold glass of water is literally the best way to start your morning. I've done it every single day for over three years now, way before they were a partner on the show, and I love it. Best of all, there is a no BS, no questions asked refund policy, so you can buy absolutely risk-free, and if you do not like it for any reason, they will give you your money back, and you don't even need to return the box. Right now, you can get a free sample pack of all eight flavors with your first box by going to the link in the description below or heading to drinklmnt.com slash modernwisdom. That's drinklmnt.com slash modern wisdom thank you very much for tuning in if you enjoyed that clip you will love the full-length podcast in all its glory which is available right here go on press it